21 respond to a report of a stalled elevator with entrapment at 25950 East Quincy Avenue. Truck 21 respond to a report of a stalled elevator with entrapment at 25950 East Quincy Avenue. Respond on TAC 2. Time is 0231. How many times have you heard those words over the firehouse speakers? As the city of Aurora continues to expand, we have seen and will continue to see more multi-story and high-rise buildings. This will increase the need for elevator rescues. It's important to understand and increase our knowledge of elevator rescue so that we can rescue the occupants and keep our personnel safe. In this training, we will learn about the three types of elevators and elevator components, two basic elevator rescues, and to identify when additional resources are necessary, the tools needed for effective and safe elevator operations, and basic elevator rescue procedures. Hey, this is Dave Reynolds from the Training Division. Thanks for taking part in this learning about basic elevator rescue. Most of these slides will advance automatically, except for those with video. Review the slide identifying the three types of elevators, then watch the video on the next slide. After the video, discuss with your crew what are the three types of elevators and where you would find their power shutoffs. It'll be useful to take the information from this training and look at elevators in your area. There are three types of elevator, hydraulic, traction, and MRL or machine roomless. It's important to know what type of elevator you have because it's gonna help you identify where the power shutoff is. The most common type of elevator is the hydraulic elevator. Hydraulic elevators are pushed from the bottom of the elevator car by a hydraulic piston similar to a mechanic's vehicle lift. Because the elevator is pushed from the bottom of the car, the machine room will normally be located on the lowest floor next to the elevator shaft. In taller buildings, the elevators are typically traction elevators. Traction elevators are hoisted up the elevator shaft with cables from the top of the elevator car. The traction elevator machine room is located in a room above the elevator shaft, so the crew members assigned to controlling power will need to access the top floor and look for a room above the elevator. As well as they do. If you have a traction elevator, you usually have a penthouse, they call it, where the, uh, the cable cars and uh, the motors and the shiv and all that sits up above the elevator and that's going to be usually a floor above the last floor that the elevator rides on or it could be a couple more floors above depending on how the engineering of the building was set up. Of the three types of elevator machine rooms, the MRL or machine room list can be the most difficult. The reason that they're difficult is because the machine, the mechanics of it, are in the shaft weight and then they can put the power shut off almost anywhere. For an MRL elevator, it's a machine roomless elevator. Uh, you're going to be on a hunt because you cannot find a machine room normally with it. It is uh, more of a economical standpoint elevator where they want to put less inside the building so they make a very weird door jam for the power or they make it into a closet or it could be down the hall and in the janitor's closet and they just ran electricity to the mainline power and the entire elevator machine this oil rig that you see here will be inside the hoistway with the elevator either below the elevator in the pit or above the elevator in a traction style but it's all in the hoistway and the power is somewhere in that hallway and that could be on floor zero one two three four five or six you just don't honestly know where that elevator mainline power can be uh, we're here at gaylord of the rockies resort and we're looking at their elevators they've got one of them in their sports bar and the power control to that is in the elevator doorway so if we look over to my right we can see this panel with no identifying marks and if we open that up that's how we control power we're actually on the second floor we're not on the first floor so these these mrl machine room list controls can be in a closet away from the elevator they can be anywhere on any floor and they're often difficult to identify
best time to identify the type of elevator you have and where the power shutoffs are, the elevator machine room is during inspections and area familiarization. This will help make the 2 a.m. elevator rescue much more simple. get on scene and you know that it's going to be a rescue in the elevator uh, hoistway and any elevator that's near the same elevator that you're going to be doing the operations on should have the power shut off to it. So you could have three elevators, four elevators all in the same hoistway. I recommend you finding the machine room and then you come to the power and you have to shut it off. So when you come in here this is just a standard hydraulic elevator where there's only one elevator you have two sets of power that can be confusing, right? So you have what is the light for the elevator. It's the, the emergency lighting and the fan and everything of that sort that kind of keeps a patient or a victim in the elevator calm. You don't want to shut that off because one, that's going to help us on the rescue because we're going to be able to see inside the elevator and also it's going to keep them calm. And we want to keep them in the most calm manner possible and we want to keep them cool because it's warm inside elevators and the power is shut off and they don't have a fan. So that's 120 volts. That's usually pretty common um, across elevator companies. Uh, you'll see that, and usually it'll be labeled. It'll say, you know, fan or emergency lighting or standard lighting. So don't shut that off. That's very important to leave that on. But you don't want to get that mistaken for your actual elevator power. So right here, you'll have your elevator labeled. So there's only one elevator in this building. So it's just MDP elevator disconnect. So this is the major uh, power source that we need to shut off. So it's just a standard pull down and shut off. If it's going to be an extensive rescue and you have a machine room like we're in now in this elevator room, you want to either keep, an keep a firefighter in here with the, sh the power shut off or use your lockout tag out kit so nobody can shut this power and turn it back on. So just put it Remember, Power to the elevator motor must be off prior to opening the doors to the elevator shaft. This is important for the safety of the occupants and the safety of our firefighters. There are three types of elevators, hydraulic, traction, and MRL, or machine roomless. The important part is to understand the location of the elevator machine room and the power shutoffs. For hydraulic elevators, the elevator machine room is going to be located on a lower floor next to the elevator shaftway. For traction elevators, the power shutoffs are going to be in an elevator machine room above the elevator shaftway at the highest level. For MRL, because the motor is located in the shaftway itself, there's not an elevator machine room. So the power shutoff is typically located in an access panel near the elevator or on the elevator, but it can be located on any floor. It's important to identify that there are two doors in an elevator system. There's the shaft door, and you'll find one of these doors on each level of the building, and then there's the elevator car door. The first one that we need to overcome is the elevator shaft door. To do that, we've already controlled the power, and then we need to identify the appropriate, uh, appropriate elevator key. Most elevator hoistway doors require a drop key. This key is used for doors that have about a 3 8 inch to half inch hole on the hoistway door. The location of the hole can vary from door to door due to design and installation variances. Here we see two different types of hoistway door locks. The direction of the hoistway lock release and the amount of force required to actuate the release is different from door to door. If you try turning the drop key in one direction and it doesn't work, try the other direction. The goal is to lift or move the release mechanism on the hoistway door so it releases the lock at the top of the door. So the gate 
restrictor is a locking mechanism that's designed to keep the passengers riding inside of the elevator to not open that elevator door. Uh, it's for a safety reasons behind if they're even just riding between floors and a kid goes to open that door just because he's curious or because they get trapped inside the elevator and they start to panic and they want to open that door. Um, but the gate restrictor should hold them up. The gate restrictor is uh, a mechanism that allows about a three inch opening, but they're all different with various designs. The gate restrictor holds up a lot of firefighting crews when rescuing passengers because they do not know how to defeat the locking mechanism behind it. So if you were going to make a quick uh, rescue because your elevator was just caught at this floor and we had the hoistway door open, we know where it is, the power shut off, uh, this is a totally fine and safe rescue. All we have to do is manipulate this elevator door past the gate restrictor. We would have uh, another firefighter holding this door and um, just have a safety guy, you know, your officer. This is just a single company response right here. This isn't really technical. So all we have to do is push this paddle down and this paddle manipulates this locking mechanism up here. So have a flashlight because it is dark in the hoistway. Make contact with your passenger, tell them what's going on, tell them that we're gonna get them out of the elevator. Just stand back from the door that we're gonna be opening this elevator door. And once we have made contact with them, and we're gonna go about our business and we're gonna basically get to about this point and we're gonna be caught on the lock. So all we have to do for that is we're gonna push in on our paddle and we're just going to guide it around the gate restricting lock and then we're going to open it. It's important to note that all elevator doors on the cab will have gate restrictors, but each elevator car might be different. The type of gate restrictor can be different depending on the manufacturer and who installed it. So be patient, take time to identify what those gate restrictors look like and how to overcome them. Most elevator entrapments can be handled by a single resource and fall into two categories, unassisted and assisted. Elevator rescues that fall outside the two basic elevator rescue categories should indicate a request for more resources. Advanced elevator rescues should include a battalion chief to take command so that the company officer can operate as the safety officer. Additionally, you should request heavy rescue eight. Heavy Rescue 8 brings some additional tools, but most importantly, they provide fall protection. Crews should never perform an elevator rescue in an open elevator shaftway without formal fall protection. Of the two basic elevator rescue categories, unassisted will be the most common. An unassisted elevator rescue is when the elevator car is within 12 to 16 inches of the landing and the occupants can step out of the elevator without help. The occupant simply needs the fire crew to access the elevator doors so they can extricate themselves from the elevator car. The next type of elevator rescue is an assisted rescue. An assisted rescue is when the elevator car is stopped at a distance that is greater than 16 inches, but not more than 36 inches. The occupants will need assistance getting out of the elevator with the use of an attic or a step ladder. If the distance is greater than 36 inches, you will need to request additional resources. Other rescues that fall outside of basic elevator rescue is anytime you're working in an open shaftway or when the occupants are unable to exit the elevator using the elevator doors, such as a blind shaft, long plenum, 
or other building features that restrict access to the elevator door. If you face these situations, you'll need additional resources to reduce the risk to your crew and the occupants of the elevator. Remember to ask for a battalion chief and heavy rescue eight so you have a safety officer and fall protection. Probably 50% of successful elevator rescue operations is having the right tools available. Most of the stalled elevator incidents with passenger entrapment can be managed using a basic set of elevator rescue tools and equipment. For basic elevator rescue, you will need the appropriate PPE, elevator door keys, building keys, and fire service control keys. Flashlights are essential for identifying restrictors and working in an open hoist way. Pike poles can be helpful in overcoming gate restrictors when the top of the elevator is between floors. Use of ladders is often needed to access the elevator and assist occupants out of the elevator. Bring plenty of door wedges with you for chalking open machine room doors and elevator hoistway doors. Bring basic hand tools such as screwdrivers and wrenches, as well as rope and webbing for basic fall protection and radios for communication. A set of irons may be needed, but should be the last resort. Only force open elevator doors when all attempts to gain access have failed and there is a need for medical attention. Otherwise, wait for the elevator service technician. The more complex the elevator incident is, the more likely is the need for additional equipment. Having tools and equipment ready will streamline the operation and minimize risk. Elevator rescue is a procedure driven operation. You will need to follow these five steps to ensure the safety of the elevator occupants and the safety of your crew. Not following this procedure will not only increase risk, but may delay the removal of the occupants. Step one, locate the elevator. Step two, make contact with the elevator occupants. Step three, attempt to reset the elevator. Step four, control power to the elevator motor. Step five, remove the occupants from the elevator car. To locate the position of the elevator, there are several sources that could be available to us. Remember, we are looking for clues and we should always confirm any non-verified information. This starts with talking to the people on scene, which can include friends, family, coworkers, building maintenance, or building management. It'll be helpful to get building management and maintenance involved early in rescue operations if available. They'll be a good resource to help locate power shutoffs and machine rooms. Additionally, they can contact elevator repair technicians, which will be valuable during advanced rescues and will be needed to evaluate the elevator prior to putting the elevator back into operation. The fire department does not put elevators back into service if there have been any issues. This must be done by an elevator technician. The next clue that we are looking for to identifying the position of the elevator is the hallway position indicator lights. These typically are above the elevator doors on the first floor. The hall position indicator may not be accurate. If the elevator car is stuck between floors, it could give you an inaccurate position, but should get you in the right area. The last step to locating the elevator is to visualize the elevator car if needed. After we have controlled power to the elevator motor, then we can confirm the position of the elevator car by opening the hoistway. Normally, we want to do this from the lowest floor, or if necessary, we want to try to do this from just one floor above the elevator. This is to limit the drop distance in the open hoistway. Before doing this, make sure you've identified who the safety is. Uh, we never want to operate in an open hoistway without safety. and We want to make sure that we have helmet and eye protection to prevent injuries. So at this point, we've located and confirmed where the elevator is in the elevator hoistway. The next step is to make contact with the occupants of the elevator. When we make contact, we wanna first ask if everybody in the elevator car is all right. Is anyone hurt? 
or need medical attention. Next, we want to know how many people are in the elevator and how long have they been stuck in the elevator car. These three questions, medical issues, number of occupants, and length of time being trapped will determine our actions if we're unable to gain access to the elevator. Remember, you should have an elevator technician already responding. They bring more knowledge and experience, so you may want to keep the occupants calm and wait for the elevator tech if there's no medical needs and the occupants are comfortable. Next, ask one of the occupants to check that the red emergency stop button is in the pull run position. If the button is pushed in, the elevator will not work. So have some way in the elevator, pull on the button and into the pull run position. Lastly, ask the occupants to stay away from the elevator car door. This will help prevent possible injuries while we are working on gaining access to the elevator. Before we start the elevator rescue, there are three simple procedures we can do that will often reset the elevator. First, always try using the elevator call button. For some elevator issues, using the elevator call button will bring the elevator to the designated floor and open the doors to the elevator car. If the elevator call button didn't work, we will next place the elevator into Phase 1 Fire Service Control. The Phase 1 Fire Service Control keyway will normally be on the first floor next to the elevator call button. Not all elevators come with fire service control and you will need to have the fire service control key with you. The last step in the process is to cycle the power to the elevator motor. Modern elevators are controlled with a computer processor and like most computers turning the power off for 20 to 30 seconds can reset the processor and potentially correct any problems. If you are not able to reset the elevator, you will need to shut down the power to the elevator motor so that you can make it safe for rescue operations. Remember, there are two power shutoffs for each elevator car. As a rule of thumb, the power to the elevator car will have a smaller electrical power disconnect that controls the lights and fans in the elevator car and a larger power disconnect that controls the motor. Leave the smaller disconnect on so the occupants are comfortable and shut off the power to the elevator motor. Remember the power shutoffs will vary in size and configuration depending on the building and installation and the size of the elevator, but we will always want to control power to the larger power shutoff. If you're not sure, consult with a building representative if available. Once power to the elevator motor is off, radio command and begin the rescue. Now that power is controlled to the elevator motor, we can begin the rescue. First, remind the occupants to move to the back of the elevator car to prevent injury, then begin to access the occupants by opening the elevator hoistway door and then the elevator car door. Remember to open the elevator car door, you will need to identify the gate restrictor and then disengage it. Next, have a firefighter enter the elevator to aid the occupants and to provide a ladder if needed. Once the occupants are out of the elevator, remember to collect basic information such as name and phone number so that you'll have the information to complete your report and then leave the elevator out of service. Only an elevator technician is qualified to put the elevator back in service. To review, elevator rescues are procedure driven. It is important to follow the five steps in this training so that the rescue is successful and we keep the elevator occupants and our firefighters safe. Something that is often forgotten is to contact an elevator technician early into the rescue. They can be a tremendous asset if the rescue becomes more difficult, and they are the only people who can put the elevator back into service. Remember, during an elevator rescue, the most important safety issue we need to be aware of is when we open the hoistway doors. Never open hoistway doors without controlling the power to the elevator motor first, and always have some type of fall protection if we're operating near an open hoistway. Most elevator rescues will only need a single unit response, but be proactive in recognizing the need and then in requesting an upgraded response when the elevator rescue becomes more advanced. Thanks for participating in basic elevator rescue. As always, the more you train on elevators, the better you will be when the call comes. 
So take time to look at elevators in your area and go over the steps given in this training. Thanks.